Hello everyone, I'm Nick Hopwood and I'll be working with you on a publications workshop or masterclass in the next coming weeks. I've prepared this video for you to watch before the workshop in order to reduce the amount of time on the day that you spend sitting and listening to me talk to Slice and to maximise the chance we have for group discussion and for things that are particularly relevant to you. Some of what's included in what follows might be a bit basic to you or already known. It's always good to be reminded of these things and I even found it useful putting it together. What I'd like you to do is to come to the workshop with some notes about the key learning points you took from it, if there were some, I hope so, some questions you have or things you'd like some more information about, or if you knew all this stuff already, some notes about how you've been going about choosing journals and finding information about how journals compare with each other. So please come to the workshop with either some key learning points, some questions, or ready to discuss how you're doing some of the things that I've been talking about. Uh, on we go, thank you. One of the first things I'd like to discuss briefly is the importance of copyright and intellectual property issues. As you can see from these two diagrams here, when you submit a paper to a journal, you have to promise that these are submitted solely to that journal and not published in press or submitted elsewhere. That means you absolutely cannot submit the same paper to two journals at once at the same time. It shouldn't be logical to have exactly the same text going to two different journals anyway, but this is really a frowned upon thing and the chances of getting caught are quite high. You also can't send to a journal something that's already in the public domain and that may count for some kinds of conference papers. You can avoid that by uh, making your conference papers shorter drafts of papers that you then rework and develop and submit. That's normally okay. Things like putting things on blogs or chapters and sharing them as well can mean that you can't tick these buttons and confirm that this is not already in the public domain. So the importance of managing your copyright and intellectual property right from the word go, I cannot stress enough. I want to use this slide briefly to help situate what I think the most value of the workshop that you're going to attend will be. And that's partly by making sure that in the workshop we don't cover things that you can find out more efficiently and easily elsewhere. And many of the questions that I've had from participants in workshops in the past have fallen under this. So firstly, you're all really smart people, whether students or established academics, and there's a lot that you can find out on your own initiative, or many of you are. Journal web pages are so important and have so much information about impact factors, style guidelines, word limits. If the journal you're thinking of doesn't have a web page with that information, I'd be thinking twice about submitting to the journal. Peers, if you're a doctoral student, then talking to other students about their publishing process is most likely to be valuable because they're the closest to you in terms of their direct experience. Other academics, I'm constantly badgering colleagues about information about journals, who they know is editing them, and things like that. And if you are a doctoral student, obviously your supervisors will be able to give you quite field-specific information. This is part of making the point that in choosing journals and beginning the publication process, Doing a huge amount of homework is really important, but a lot of that can be done outside of workshops like this, and I hope that the workshop will focus on things that are really unique and that you can't find elsewhere. Many people have questions about choosing a journal, and absolutely the most important thing is the fit or the match between the paper that you want to write and the journal that you want to publish in. There can be a great paper sent to the wrong journal will get rejected. Okay, so no, it's not just a question of how good your writing is or your paper, it is a question of fit and that's what the editors are there to police and to make sure. I suggest you create a short list of journals before you write your paper, but after you have an idea of what you're going to write. So maybe you've got an abstract developed or you think, well, the paper's going to kind of make this sort of argument. Then you think, well, where might that fit? And you start creating a short list of journals. As you're doing so, you're thinking, what conversation are you joining? Most journals will not want to accept a paper that's the first paper ever in that journal to address a particular issue. You want to be showing that you're joining an ongoing conversation that's happening in that journal. You might want to ask about the status of the journal, and I'll talk through all the sorts of different ways you can assess the status of journals. It's quite a complicated thing, but a very doable thing once you understand it. You've also got to think about who do you want to read this paper? It may be that publishing in a higher status paper is not where the people that you want to read it are going to find it. And so that's a very important thing to bear in mind. You must also absolutely do your homework, things like word limits, who the editors are, 
And if you look at the names on the journal web pages, then Google those names, find out what they're publishing, find out if they have a kind of mission to shape the journal in a particular way. You also want to find out what the time to publication is and whether that includes things like online first so that you don't have to wait for it to go into press. In social sciences, peer review can often take nine months to 12 months and then it can be another 12 or 24 months before it's in print, but it should become online faster than that. All that information is going to affect your choice of journal. Uh, I've put at the bottom there a hyperlink to a blog which I've written which covers some of the information that I'm going to talk through here and should be useful to you. The question of what status journals have and how you know what the status or the journal is, is a very important question. And here's a summary of the information that's going to follow next. I'll talk a bit about impact factor, which is a very specific measure, and that's the average number of times, average as in mean, number of times that a particular paper in a journal is cited in other journals. And I put there indexed journals. It's not every single journal, but Thomson Reuters, who run the impact factor measurement system, um, have a list of journals and the journals that are on that list, they count. And normally citations are done over a two year period. There are also citations over a five year period of impact factor. Impact factor is in some ways what I put there the most robust measure. It's the one that's most used in the sciences and the health fields and the um, mathematics and things like that. It is available for most arts and social sciences journals or for many of them, but there are flaws, particularly because in social sciences and arts, we have outputs that are not in journals. We get cited in books, cited in book chapters, and those citations don't count as part of impact factor. I put there, the next one is alt impact, alternative impacts, and Scopus SJR has an indicator which includes information like impact factor but other information so you can go on Wikipedia and look in my blog for more information about that. It tends to have a larger list of journals at least in my experience in social sciences. There is also a Scopus mean sites per year fact indicator um, which is very much like the impact factor. The third thing I'll talk about is the ERA zombie ranks which is a way in Australia that all the journals, or many of them, were ranked A star, A, B or C. And it uses a range of sources, including impact factor and academic assessments of what the journals in their fields were, and which the good ones were. They're no longer officially in use, but the information is very rapidly available and it's good to check to know whether you're going for something that used to be an A star or a C. I will finally talk about a lot of soft status indicators, things like who is publishing the journal and who is publishing elsewhere and is citing from it. Well, the big important message is there at the bottom. All single measures are flawed and you'll need to make an informed assessment based on multiple pieces of information about the status of a particular journal. This slide is not about the details of how impact factor is calculated, but how you can find out the information of an impact factor. The first and most obvious place to look is the journal web page. And it's not hard to find that information when it is available for a particular journal. Normally these are based on the Thomson Reuters impact factor measures. And so on the top left, you can see an image there. It says journal news, 2012 impact factor 1.036. Impact factors are normally a measure between zero and up to 10 or 20 with three decimal places, so 0 0.036. If you go to a journal web page and impact factor is not on its home page very, very clearly, another thing you can do is just put the journal name and then ResearchGate into Google, and all of a sudden you'll find in the results page, ResearchGate, or studies, for I did it for studies in higher education, you go to the ResearchGate page and that will show some information about the impact factor. Now, if you notice here on this example, it's got impact and five-year impact, and a whole load of different measures. These are actually for the same journal. You can see that the research gate 0 0.98 and the one on the left, which said 1.036, are not the same figure. So research gate may not be totally up to date, but it may have an impact value for a web a journal which is not uh, available on its home page. What's crucial is that the absolute impact factor value is not as important as its relative one in terms of making an assessment of the journal status. A scientist may tell you that an impact factor of 10 or less is useless, whereas in social sciences anything over one is quite high. So you want to make sure that you're not shaped by people outside of your discipline in terms of what a benchmark for a good impact factor might be. And you're going to have to, if you want to know this information, 
use some of the databases through libraries or some of the freely available ones to check to make a list of journals by impact factor in your field so you know whether 1.036 is a high impact factor or not. It's high compared to other journals in your field, not compared to every journal across all disciplines. I mentioned already that Scopus SJR have a slight alternative to impact factors. An easy way to find that out for your journal is to Google the journal name and then the letters SJR and you go through the following the top link and on the, this slide I've shown some of the images that come up when you do that. The one on the top right shows the SJR which is the SJR indicator. The sites per doc is the one that's rather like impact factor, how many times each paper gets cited in the other journals and you can see their trend over a five year period there. Uh, the graph at the bottom there, the yellow and the purple lines is showing the same information. The purple one is sites per doc, rather like impact factor, and the yellow one is the SJR indicator. So you can see whether a journal is going up in the world or whether it's becoming less important. Again, you have to find out the relevant information, which is what's relative, not the absolute value. So here's the example for studies in higher education. I need to go and check against other journals to see if a SJR value of 1.49 is high or low or in the middle. You have to know the databases for your field. I've mentioned knowing about the relative position of journals according to their impact factor or SJR value. And as I've said before, don't be misled by some people telling you that an impact factor of less than 10 or 20 means a journal is rubbish. In your field, the mean impact factor will vary. What you need to be able to do if you're going to do this properly is to get good at databases and have some proficiency in using something like Excel. What I did was I went to Web of Science, which I went through my university library website through their um, list of databases. Or, and I also went through the URL there for SciMigo, which is um, uh, the Scopus Journal Rankings. Thing which you can do via that web, web link. And I created, I downloaded all the information under the field of education, which is hundreds and hundreds of journals. And then what I did was I created a column ranks by relevant indicators. So I took the, for example, um, SJR indicator, which is a column, or this is a, the one you're looking at is actually the Thomson Reuters. So column D there was impact factor. Now I sorted that list by impact factor so that the highest was at the top and I put number one in a new column next to that. And then I scroll down two, three, four, five, six. You can get Excel to do that. So I completed it. It went down to about 350, something like that. That's my impact factor rank position. Then if I search by, say, the journal title and I want to look where the Australian educational researcher is, I know that its rank was in rank number 215. And the Australian Journal of Adult Learning, the other one highlighted in green there, is ranked 217 out of however many it was there. I did the same thing for the five-year impact factor. So you can see column G, this is a column I created. I listed it by five year impact factor from top to bottom. I put one for the top one and carried it all the way down, increasing a number to the bottom one. So I can see how this one fits. You'll notice the Australian Journal of Adult Learning does not have a five year impact factor because it wasn't part of that system for that period of time. I did exactly the same thing with the Scopus journal rankings, created my own column for the actual rank position out of all the journals in my field. And in that case, it was over 600 journals. It turned out that one of the journals studies in higher education was in the top 6% of journals in that field that I published in. And yet the impact factor was 1.036. So knowing its relative position with education was really good for me to know that. I mentioned it before, the ERA zombie ranks. Now, for a time in Australia and New Zealand, uh, the government ranked a lot of journals, not all of them, but a lot of them, either A star, A, B or C. Now, this was an absolute measure. It didn't have to look up relative information and manage interdisciplinary differences. An A star in science was supposedly as good as A star in other fields in terms of its relative status. So it already taken into account the difference between fields. Um, and it used a battery of measures, including what academics said they recognised as the best journals in their fields. Rankings are now dead. The ARC and the government have said, please do not use them. But they're still around. Hence, I call them zombie status or zombie ranks. You can find out the rankings from the 2010, which is the last time the rankings were implied, and is a useful extra indicator in your battery of measures that you're going to use to assess the state of a particular journal. I've put the URL there on the slide. When you click on that URL, in order to go to the rankings, you have to go where I put the red arrow and look at historical data. 
Once you've clicked on historical data, you'll get a page that looks a bit like this. You want to click on journal ranking lists. Then I suggest what you do is follow the red arrow again and make sure you're looking under ERA 2010 finalized lists and click 2010 comprehensive final lists by all or part of journal name. You'll see what happens on the next slide. What you do now is enter all or part of a journal name. If you have a particular journal in mind, you can type in the full title. If you just have an area or a topic or a keyword that you want to have a look at different kinds of journals that might have that keyword in, then you can just type that in. So for me, higher education, now I know that's the name of one journal, but I also know there are lots of journals that have that in their title and that was relevant to me at the time. So you put that in and hit search. And ta-da, this is what you get. So here you can see that the journal Computers in Higher Education Economics Review was ranked C, but the journal Studies in Higher Education was ranked A star. And that's interesting that that had, we've seen, I've been looking at an example all the way through these slides, that had an impact factor of 1.036. I knew from the Scopus that it had a high um, Scopus indicator and in fact was in the top 6% when I did my database studies. And now we're finding that the ERA used to rank it as an A-star journal. So all those things are telling me that this is a good journal in my field. Interestingly, 1.036 when compared to many journals in sciences would look terrible. So the impact factor alone is not going to be useful to you if you don't do your relative comparisons within your field. Here's a list I, looking at this list, I could easily see that studies might be my first preference for journal, and then I had no backups that would be A-ranked journals. Remembering these ranks are now zombie ranks. It's important to remember that the ERA still maintain a list of what they deem to be quality journals. And this list is updated, and we've just recently been through a process in Australia where you could nominate journals to be added to the list for the next assessment of research in Australia. Now the list no longer has rankings, but a very, very crude indicator of quality is, is a journal listed on the list or not? It's a binary one, a one or a zero. And you can do this, you can go back to the same URL, the original homepage I showed you earlier on a few slides back. And instead of going to historical data, this time you just go to 2012 final list. I expect fairly soon this will be updated with a 2014 or 2015 list. You can type in by journal name or um, ISSN, which is the number, like the um, serial number, or you can look for it under a particular keyword again by clicking that same hyperlink. So let's see what happens on the next slide if you do that. You can see what we get is a list of journals with no ranking information there. Now, if you typed in a particular journal name or a keyword from a journal title and it's not listed, that means it's not recognized by the ERA currently as a quality journal. And unfortunately, that would mean that at least in many universities, including UTS, your journal publication would not be recognised actually as a publication output. It would not contribute to the income that the universities get through what's called the HERDC, H-E-R-D-C, and nor would it be really submissible as part of the ERA assessment of the quality of research from a particular university is. If the journal is on that list, it doesn't mean it's an amazing journal, but it means that at least it will be counted as a research output in Australia. If you remember when I gave an overview of the different indicators of status, I mentioned impact factor, alternative impact metrics, ERA zombie ranks and soft indicators. By soft, I mean they're not reduced to a particular number or letter, which is what all the ones I've talked about so far do. These soft measures might actually be the most important ones. For example, who's going to read this journal if you publish your paper in it? If it's a very general journal, which tend to be the ones that have the higher impact factor, and the higher other metrics and the higher rankings. It may be that all the people in the particular research community that you're interested in may not read it. And it may be that some of the lower status ones are the ones that everybody that you're working closely with internationally, that you want to get to know your work, the people you see at conferences and whose talks you go to, read a quite a specific journal which has maybe quite a low status because it's quite a specific and small field. Therefore, there aren't lots of citations to that work, even though everybody in your field might be reading and citing from it. So how can you tell who's reading? Well, it's people. How can, you can also... Look at the people that you like, whose research you like, and see where they're citing. In their bibliographies at the end of their journal articles, what journals have they clearly been reading? Look at who's published in the journal. If nobody you respect has published it in the past five or six years, you might want to think twice. 
You can also think, is the journal leading the way in taking up new ideas or theories of which your research is part? Or is it lagging behind? In which case, maybe your particular approach might not get a very favourable reading from the editors or reviewers. Or maybe you think some of the journals are accepting what's now very trendy rubbish and you want to go for something where actually preserving some of the traditional values and standards is more what you're trying to do. So where the journal fits in in the trends and the developments of ideas is important. There is no website or URL I can give you to answer those questions. That's about you knowing your field, knowing people in your field and using all the information you can, including talking to other people and your supervisors and talking to people in conferences and doing some digging about who's reading what. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Indicators of status are important, but they shouldn't be the overriding decision or automatically overriding decision about which journal you're going to publish in. You might want to think about who pays, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide. But somebody at some point pays for a journal to be published or pays to read it, and that may influence your decision. You may want to consider how long it times before, takes before something is published. Many journals these days have an online preview, which means quite quickly after you've had it accepted, you do your proofs, you sign your copyright form, and it goes online. It doesn't get an issue number and pages, maybe for a t one or two years, but it has a digital object index by number and that counts as in the public domain. The word limits are important. If you have a journal uh, paper, that, an argument that takes 6,000 words to develop, you can't submit it to a journal that only asks for 5,000 words. I would also, on the issue of word limits, recommend that whatever you do, you submit 500 words to 1,000 words below the limit. The chances are the referees will want more information, and if you've got 500 words to play with, it's quite easy to do that in your revisions. If you submit a 5,000 word paper and the limit is 5,000 words and the referees say we'd like more in the literature review or more on the methods, we'd like a bit more discussion and an extra thing about limitations in the conclusions, you're going to be stuck. You might also be thinking about, well, here's a journal which I think might take an argument I'm interested in, but it's not quite the one I want to make. How much are you willing to bend to fit your paper to a journal? Remembering if it's going to be accepted, there has to be that fit as well as quality. A good quality paper is not going to guarantee acceptance. A good quality paper that fits is probably going to be accepted. You get lucky with the reviewers. And then, of course, there's what happens in the review process. And that's a whole other issue. And we'll spend a lot of time in the workshop talking about that. The question of who pays and open access and copyright is becoming a very important one in publishing. If a journal is not an open access journal, you cannot put your published paper from a journal on your website um, and enable it to be freely downloaded, at least not immediately, depending on the copyright form that you sign, which you should read in full and closely and talk to the library or your supervisor if you don't understand it. Um, you may be allowed to do so after a certain number of years, but most publishers will have an embargo for between three or five years, maybe even longer, some perhaps even indefinitely. Now, I put on this diagram three different colours to discuss three different kinds of journals. The green one is the kind of standard one that most people are used to working in. This is the closed access commercial publisher. So Taylor and Francis, Routledge, Wiley, all those people, uh, big companies that have standard journal websites. They have big, often these journals have strong reputations. They've been allowed for a long time. You don't pay to publish. You don't pay to have your uh, paper reviewed. But what somebody at some point does is pay to read the paper. Now, many of these journals, your university will have a subscription, so it's free to you as a student or a member of that university. But anybody else looking at it will have to pay to access it, maybe 20 or $30. What you can do is pay, and sometimes it's hundreds, sometimes it's thousands of dollars, to make that particular paper open access, which means when somebody finds it online through the journal website, they don't have to go and pay to go and read it. And in some of the sciences, that's what's happening. People are paying for open access um, through those commercial publishers. Anything that's submitted through a Scholar One system would be in this green category. In this case, the publishers take 100% of any money made out of this. You get absolutely no money for publishing in it whatsoever. And these can have some of the best journals as well as some near bottom quality journals. So just because it's closed access and you, um, the copyright is signed over to the publishers does not guarantee quality. The blue one 
I'm not sure how long these will last given what's the pressures in the current system, but there are some what are open access university linked journals. I published in one that was called the International Journal of Qualitative Methods, except that's now in the orange category. Some are new, some are quite established. They're free to readers, meaning open access, and free for you to publish in them. This is why I don't think they're going to last very long, because they're free on both sides. Somebody's paying, and that usually means the university's taking a hit to host the journal and to, for the editors. Um, these journals may be wanting to drum up submissions, so you may have a higher chance of getting in them. And because they're open access, they can have a very wide readership. My most cited journal paper with now 80 odd citations, is from one of these blue kind of journals, or one that used to be in this blue category. And these can be quite high quality and they can be terrible quality, both the journals and the papers within them. And now what's tending to happen is there are open access pay to publish journals. So the person paying is the person writing the paper and currently it's not obvious how many universities will enable people to meet this fee. It may have to come out of your own pocket. Some of these are established journals, some of them are very new, some of them used to be free and are now charging um, authors, which has happened with the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. And you usually, you may have to pay on acceptance, some even you pay to submit, whether you get, and that doesn't guarantee you whether you get accepted or not, you're actually paying for the peer review process. Some of these could be good quality, some of them may be bottom quality. Now, here's an email I received last week from the Journal of Education and Training Studies. It looks like it's addressed to me personally, dear Dr. Nick Hopwood, and somebody's read a couple of my papers. Um, and it looks like quite a personal email. And it's asking for submissions to the journal. Now, if you're looking for a really high quality journal, if the editor is having to send things to you asking for submissions, generally meaning that not many people are sending in articles to that journal. Now, if it's a new journal with good editors and a good strong mission, there's nothing wrong with contributing to that. But on the whole, if a journal is sending begging letters to authors, I'd be wary about it. And it's not as personal as it is. I've had a couple of these come through where you can clearly see that this is done through a database. and It's an automatic email that gets generated. A very un be very surprised if the editor actually had read my paper and um, wanted to personally send me this. It could have been a personal kind of um, decision by the editor, but I was somehow doubt it. So what looks promising, doesn't it? You know, I've been reading your paper. Um, I'm an editor of this new journal. It's highly peer reviewed and we're looking for some high quality papers. Well, I'll show you what came later in the email on the next slide. When I look down at the details, you look at number F, it says publication fee is paid. So this is one of those journals that's in the orange category from two slides above. OK, so I would submit my manuscript online. The editor will check it. It will go for peer review, double blind system. The decision is made. And then if I'm accepted, I have to pay the fee. And for me, that means no, I've not got the money to pay the fee. I'm not going to go for a journal where I have to pay the fee. Some people will feel that that's an ethical thing to do because it means it's free to the readers. At the moment, I'm not in a position to actually pay that money and I don't know how much the fee will be. So I've talked a lot about the choice of journals because it's very important and many of you have had questions about that and we can talk more about it in the workshop. I'd just like to briefly touch upon now what happens. So you've chosen a journal, you've got a shortlist at least. I would say double check your choice and have a backup in case of rejection. So paper I'm currently working on, I have one journal that's going to be my target journal. If we get rejected from that, I know which one the second choice will be, but I could only send it to one at a time. Then you read all the instructions, including the style guidelines, the aims and scope, all of the information you can on the journal homepage. I would always print off a couple of recent papers, look at their formatting, look at the kind of language they're using, particularly ones that are close to the conversation that I'm joining. You really got to make sure you know which papers came closest to your article or your topic in that journal in the most recent years. If you haven't already, you register for the online submission system. You have a maybe you do a dummy run and see what they're going to ask you to do. And then if they don't have a word template to download, and many of them do and insist that you use it, I would set up a word template so that you have the headings right and formatted and you make sure you send a note to yourself about the references. Um, create yourself a formatting checklist. I do that for different things for different journals or it's like this one, they want the figures named underneath or they want them in separate files. And then I would skeleton my paper, meaning heading by heading and subheadings, and then maybe the first sentence of each paragraph. 
always remember that that choice about the journal and the fit between your paper and the journal may change as you actually come to write the paper. Don't assume just because it was the right fit at the beginning. If your argument changes or the literature aspects that you draw on change or the theory or the methodology becomes slightly differently expressed or you're drawn different bits of your data, you constantly have to go and check, is the paper I'm writing a good fit for the journal? I'm not able to tell you how to write a good paper. I'm assuming you're all very smart and you have good supervision relationships and um, have a good idea, you've done good research and you know the journals in your field. I can say briefly some things about how I think the writing process usually folds out and it is multiple drafts. You draft and you redraft and you redraft your paper. I would normally send it to one or two trusted colleagues or peers for some feedback and I wouldn't just say, here's my paper, what do you think? Uh, personally, if I'm asked to do that, I think it's a very open-ended task and I'm reluctant to do it. If you can give some feedback and say, do you think the literature review works? Or do you think I've understated my conclusions? Or do you think I'm good enough on my limitations? If you give somebody a particular focus, uh, that makes the task easier for them. And then you redraft your paper again, asking yourself, does it still fit the journal? If the fit is no longer there, then you either have to change the paper or change your choice of journal. A, paper, a good paper that doesn't fit will not be accepted. Although I said you draft and you redraft and you redraft, don't try and perfect your paper before submitting it. You'll never write something that's perfect, nobody ever does, and anyway the reviewers are pretty much 100% guaranteed, even if they're going to accept it, to want to see some changes. It's very, very unusual for the paper to be accepted as it is. I'll say more about that in a second. So there's no point perfecting it because the people reading it won't see it as perfect and there'll be changes made. So write it and leave some space in the word count for those changes that the reviewers are going to want. The finishing touches are very important and from poor experience of my own I've had papers rejected or bounced back because I didn't do these things properly. You have to check your paper. Something that appears sloppy is if it gets past the editor is going to annoy the reviewers and it can change a reviewer from somebody who might offer constructive criticism and suggest minor revisions to somebody who goes for a rejection. So check your paper. Check the word count and check what counts. If it's over the word limit, an editor can just send it straight back to you and say, we invite you to resubmit your paper when it's within the stated word limit. That shouldn't be a problem for you if you follow my advice of submitting something at least 500 words below the expected limit. Check your title, check the abstract, check the keywords. Is there a structure for the abstract? How many words are you allowed in your abstract? How many keywords do you need? Is there a database of keywords which you can draw from them? Are you supposed to have separate tables and figures? What are the file kinds that they allow for tables and figures? All that has to be checked. If it's a double blind review system, you're going to have to submit an anonymized version, which may mean going to Microsoft Word and taking your name out of the properties of the file, meaning that when you cite yourself, you make it anonymous and you don't put any acknowledgements in you need to check your references. And checking references is boring, kind of anal work, but you have to do it. And if it's not done properly, they may well just send your paper straight back. Checking. All the texts that you cited in the main arguments in the paper are listed at the end. And the, all of those that listed at the end are cited. There should be nothing that you put in brackets in the paper that's not at the bottom in the bibliography, and nothing in the bibliography that's not cited in the paper. Check the format. Are the dots after initials? Are the dot and comma after multiple authors and initials? Is the initial go before or after the surname for editors? Are the DOI numbers, digital object index numbers, um, after journal articles, which there are, for example, in the now APA 6th formatting? What's italicised? Um, where are the capital letters? Is there a capital letter after a colon? Where do you put the chapter page numbers? If it's a conference, where do you put the dates? All that stuff. Check it and get it right. Don't worry, this is the next to last slide now and the last one is just some instructions to remind you of what to bring to the workshop. This is just to introduce you to how the peer review system works and we'll come back to it when we do the workshop. So you start, you submit something and it goes to the editor to review. And I'm assuming you've done all that good stuff about making a choice of journal and there's a good match between your journal and the paper. Now it may be, if you look at the red square after this, that the editor rejects it straight away. Some journals that could be 50% of what's sent in, some it could be a um, higher than that, some it could be lower. If it does get rejected, one thing that can happen is the paper just dies, which is not a very good thing because it's a waste of your time and the editor's time. Otherwise, you modify your paper and you submit it elsewhere and then it goes to review again by the editor. Hopefully, the editor sends your paper out to review. It doesn't mean they think it's going to be accepted, they just mean it's worth getting some of their reviewers who are not paid to have a look at this paper. It may be that reviewer one hates your paper. 
Reviewer 2 quite likes it and says minor revisions. And Reviewer 3, if there are three reviewers, says major revisions, which may well be different from the revisions that Reviewer 2 said. Or you could get two reviewers that both say major revisions, but say different, quite different things. If you're asked then to do some major revisions by the editor, well, two num things can happen. Firstly, the editor can say, even if they ask for major revisions, the editor can choose to reject it. Or because one person says reject and the other one says minor revisions, the editor may choose to reject. The editor may say, please revise and resubmit your paper, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about that in the workshop and what you can do. You then may go and revise and resubmit your paper, and the editor then may reject it. Or it may go back for review and then get rejected. There are other options about what to do if you're asked to revise and resubmit, which we'll talk about in the workshop. It then may go for more review, and you can have the same thing again. It may go back to the same reviewers, it may go back to one of the same reviewers, or different reviewers. This time, some of them may want more revisions, it may go back for review again. You can go through that cycle twice. Once I went through the cycle three times and then was rejected by an editor, which I didn't think was particularly good editing. It may be that then you're lucky enough to get your paper accepted. What you shouldn't expect is submit your paper and to get it accepted. That's really not going to happen. I will be making an argument in the workshop that this whole process involves a messy set of compromises about who does the reviews and who responds to them and who the, what the editors do to help you. This, this is why it's no point perfecting your paper before you send it in because it's going to get changed by what the reviewers say anyway. The best you can hope for, or should hope for, I think, is that you get asked to make minor revisions. If you get a rejection, you have a backup paper, you rework the paper quickly and you send it out. If you are asked to make major revisions, I would be celebrating. We'll talk more about this in the workshop. And so we come to the end of the pre-workshop video. Just to remind you, I'd like you to come with either a list of some of the key learning points you've taken from the video, or things that you already knew that have been emphasised for you, or any questions that you have or issues you'd like to discuss more in the workshop, or be ready to describe some of the approaches that you've been taking to select journals when you've been publishing or assess their relative status if you've already been doing that. I look forward to meeting you all very soon. Bye-bye.